Bonjour et bienvenue à l'ILARA, l'Institut des langues rares de l'École pratique des hautes études PSL. Hello and welcome to ILARA, our institute, whose aim is, is to showcase the rare and precious ancient and contemporary languages of the world. Professor Vandenhardt will speak in English, but let me int introduce our institute in French first. L'ILARA est un institut créé en août 2020 par arrêté du ministère français de l'enseignement supérieur de la recherche et de l'innovation. Sa mission est de sensibiliser et former le grand public aux langues rares, anciennes et contemporaines, et à leur culture. L'ILARA participe aussi à la valorisation et la sauvegarde de ces langues à travers des actions de documentation. Deux offres principales sont actuellement disponibles pour tous les publics. D'une part, une offre de cours d'initiation, de découverte et d'approfondissement en présentiel à Paris, et étant donné la situation en visioconférence. Vous y trouverez par exemple des initiations à l'émessal, variété du sumérien, à l'avestique récent, langue iranienne ancienne ou au grec ancien, pour donner quelques exemples de langues anciennes, au tikuna, langue d'Amazonie, au bagapukur, langue atlantique de Guinée, aux langues kartvénéennes en Géorgie méridionale ou au manchou sibé, pour donner quelques exemples de langues contemporaines. Vous y trouverez d'autre part une offre de vidéoconférence virtuelle, l'ILARA en ligne. Disponible sur notre chaîne et dont la première série, les invitations de l'ILARA, met à l'honneur des spécialistes de renommée internationale sous forme d'entretien ou de conférence. Dans le cadre de l'ILARA en ligne, nous avons accueilli cet automne, par exemple, Marianne Mithoun, Scott Delancey ou Bernard Comrie, qui nous ont fait découvrir l'extraordinaire diversité des langues d'Amérique du Nord, de l'Asie ou du Caucase. Félix Ameka, qui nous montrait la richesse du détail dans les langues de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, respectivement, ou encore Nicholas Evans, qui nous initiait aux complexités de la langue aborigène d'Alabou, d'Australie. Et, il y a deux semaines, Stephen Houston, qui nous parlait des écritures, en situant celle-ci parmi la pluralité des codes et pratiques graphiques, et de l'écriture maya en particulier, en illustrant la polyphonie des pratiques et significations de celle-ci. Toutes ces conférences sont en ligne, pour ceux qui n'auraient pu les écouter. Nous avons aujourd'hui l'honneur et le très grand plaisir d'accueillir le professeur Theo Vandenhout. Theo Vandenhout a étudié les lettres classiques, la linguistique indo-européenne et les langues et civilisations anatoliennes aux universités d'Amsterdam et de Leiden. Il est présentement le Arthur and Johan Rasmussen Professor of Western Civilization and of Hittite and Anatolian Languages à l'Oriental Institute de l'Université de Chicago. Membre correspondant de l'Académie royale hollandaise des arts et des sciences, Theo Vandenhout a été fellow de la John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation en 2016 et est senior fellow à l'Institute for the Study of the Ancient World de la New York University. Theo Vandenhout est l'éditeur en chef du Chicago Hittite Dictionary, un dictionnaire encyclopédique de référence qui non seulement inventorie les mots et les significations de la langue hittite, mais également reflète et illustre le monde matériel, social et idéal hittite à travers son lexique contextualisé. Publié lettre par lettre, avec des volumes librement téléchargeables sur le site de l'Oriental Institute, le Chicago Hittite Dictionary est un projet de très longue haleine, sur plusieurs décennies, et le résultat de recherches détaillées tout à la fois culturelles, historiques et lexicales, s'adressant à tous ceux qui sont intéressés par la société et la culture hittite. Theo Vandenhout est spécialiste non seulement des langues et écritures anatoliennes du deuxième millénaire, mais également de celles du premier millénaire. Il est aussi l'un des rares spécialistes du Hurrit, langue non indo-européenne majeure du deuxième millénaire. Ses champs de recherche portent particulièrement sur les pratiques et la sociologie de l'écrit, la constitution et la gestion des archives, ainsi que la culture visuelle dans le monde hittite du deuxième millénaire. Parmi les livres récents de Theo Vandenhout, citons The Elements of Hittite, Cambridge University Press 2011, une grammaire pédagogique de la langue hittite qui permet l'étude de cette langue et de son écriture également à ceux qui souhaiteraient l'entreprendre en autodidacte, et tout récemment, A History of Hittite Literacy, Writing and Reading in Late Bronze Age Anatolia, 1600-1200 BC, également Cambridge University Press, qui fait la synthèse des recherches récentes de l'auteur et nous amène directement au thème de ce soir. Pourquoi l'écriture cunéiforme n'a-t-elle été adoptée que relativement tardivement en Anatolie Et pourquoi ensuite les Hittites ont-ils développé leur propre écriture hiéroglyphique autochtone N'hésitez pas à poser vos questions au professeur Vandenhout en français ou en anglais à travers le chat en direct. 
Welcome to you all, and please ask your questions in the live chat, share your comments and participate. We'll gather your questions and Professor van den Hout will respond at the end of each section of his presentation. Theo, we are delighted to have you with us and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. We're looking forward to hearing you on late but twice literate writing and reading in Hittite Anatolia 1650-1200. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Stauder. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Professor uh, Metouchi um, for this uh, very, uh, for this invitation to speak at the Institut des Langues Rares at the uh, Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes. Uh, it's a great honor for me to speak to you today. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Mark Tang for making this all technically possible. Um, as Professor Stauder already mentioned, um, I would love to take your questions and we can do so after each uh, section. Um, these are the topics that I would like to talk about today. So first we will do the basics, talk about Hittite as an Indo-European language. And I, I will also briefly say something about the history of, of the field, how we came to know Hittite. Then we'll move into the prehistory of Hittite. Uh, since when do we know that Hittite people, Hittite speaking people and other uh, Indo-European speakers were in Anatolia in the old Assyrian period. Then the move, as I will explain to you, to Hattusa, the Hittite capital, and how a new dynasty around 1650 adopted a whole new cuneiform writing system. Then once they started writing in Hittite, how did they adapt that originally Mesopotamian Syrian writing system for their own language? We'll look at the question of, okay, once they started writing, what did they write, actually write down? What did they commit to uh, the clay tablets? Um, then we'll talk about, uh, actually I've turned it around first, a second script and the, that the Hittites developed next to the cuneiform. We'll talk about script carriers, so tablets and so forth. We'll look at the general social linguistic situation of Anatolia. And then finally, at the end, uh, we'll have to talk about the end. What happened uh, when the Hittite kingdom disappeared around 1200? What happened to the Hittite language and other Anatolian languages? So these are the sections that I, and the topics that I would like to address tonight with you. So let's first look at Hittite as an Indo-European language. Let's start with the where and when. So the Hittite language was spoken in what we call ancient Anatolia in roughly the second millennium BC that we also call the late bronze age. Anatolia is the classical name in the Greco-Roman period for the country that we nowadays refer to as the Republic of Turkey. When you look at this map, you will see this gray outlined area, which kind of gives you the uh, extent of the uh, kingdom of the Hittites, their sphere of influence also at its largest extension. Um, you see right here, uh, Boasköy is the modern Turkish name of a village uh, where you can visit the ruins of the original capital, Hattusa, of the Hittites. Um, the Hittites left behind so far, for us, we have found over 30,000 uh, fragments of clay tablets. Clay tablets are, as you can see on the right, almost always uh, broken. Um, and um, these documents stem for the, from the period 1650 through 1200 BC. So just over 400 years. 
how did we get to know the Hittites? It starts with actually a Frenchman, Charles Texier, who in 1862 published a, a large book, The Description de l'Asie Mineure, fait par ordre du gouvernement français. Um, and it was his account of his travels in the 1830s to uh, what was then still the Ottoman Empire uh, the, uh, and now the Republic of Turkey. And he came back with these romantic and bucolic pictures, as you see here. Um, we now know that this was the, the big temple, as we call it. And his account was actually the first written publication uh, that he brought to Western Europe and where people got to know about this then still very enigmatic uh, civilization. The very first excavation was uh, conducted also by a Frenchman, by Ernest Chantre in 1884, uh, but that lasted, I think, only one season. Um, and then he had to return to France, but he already found some tablets during that excavation uh, that are now still part of the collection of Hittite tablets at the Musée du Louvre. The real or longer lasting excavations started in 1906. Um, there were four seasons, 1906, 7, 1911 and 12 that were done by Hugo Winkler, a German Assyriologist, and he was accompanied by uh, Theodor Macridi as the representative of the Ottoman museums at that moment. During those first four seasons, they found uh, over 10,000 uh, tablets. And as of 1931, the Germans returned and uh, basically with an interruption, of course, because of the Second World War, um, they still continue. And so now the counting stands at over 30,000 uh, tablets. Winkler died in uh, 1913, and those 10,000 tablets were sent to Berlin, and they sat there. At that moment, in 1912, uh, nobody was able to read those Hittite tablets. Hittite was not deciphered yet. Although deciphered is not yet, not quite the right term because the script was known. It was the relatively familiar uh, Babylonian type of cuneiform, so people were able to read it, but the language was unknown. And that lasted until 1915. A Czech scholar, Bedrich Rosny, uh, sat in Berlin working with those 10,000 plus tablets, and he finally uh, got the idea that the cuneiform script on these tablets actually wrote the oldest known in the European language, the oldest known in the European language then in 1915, and still the oldest known in the European language. He published in 1915 his solution in an article uh, called Die Lösung des Hittitischen Problems, so the solution to the Hittite problem, because of course it had been a problem so far, who are these Hittites? They were still relatively unidentified. And in two years later, in 1917, he was able to publish the first grammar, Die Sprache der Hittita, the language of the Hittites. And now, barely a hundred years later, uh, we are a relatively young discipline, as you can see. Uh, we can make a list of the Anatolian languages of which Hittite is the best known representative. We assume there was once a unified group of Indo-European speakers, wherever they came from. We call that phase Proto-Anatolian, which is purely reconstructed, we don't have it but an Hittite is the best known representative of it. And next to Hittite, written in cuneiform on the clay tablets, as I have shown you before, um, we also know a, let's say a dialect that we call Palaic, which was written also on the clay tablets in cuneiform among the Hittite tablets. So part of the royal collections at the Hittite capital. And 
another or two other dialects, as we can say, are uh, representative of the Luwian language, the population speak Luwian, and we usually nowadays distinguish Hattusa Luwian, which is the Luwian spoken in the center, and Kizuwatna Luwian, which is more at home, the southeastern uh, part of uh, modern day Turkey, sort of around here. And that Luwian comes in cuneiform, but also in the hieroglyphs, the second script that I will talk about later. Um, then, around 1200, when the Hittite kingdom disappears, um, Luwian and the hieroglyphic script continue until about 700. Uh, then that disappears as well. But at that moment, around 700, in the west of Anatolia, right here where you see Lydia, Caria, and Lycia, local languages start being written. They pop up using an alphabetic script that at first sight may look like Greek, but isn't. Uh, they are really indigenous alphabets in those languages. They, the, the inscriptions in these languages of the first millennium uh, end about when Alexander invades uh, Anatolia, and then the last two very poorly attested uh, Anatolian languages uh, are Pesidic and Sidetic at home, right in this area on the southern uh, coast of Turkey. Uh, and they barely make it into the beginning, first at best second century AD, and then we are at the really at the very end of the. Anatolian branch of Indo-European languages. If you want to picture them geographically, um, originally at the beginning, let's say, of the uh, second millennium, we have Hittite speakers sort of in this eastern part of uh, Anatolia. Right in the center, we have Luwian speakers, and then that Palaic language that I mentioned is right there. In between, you see this name Hattian. Hattian, we call the language that was, we often call it the indigenous language. That is, when the Indo-European speaking Hittites, Luwians, and Palaeans moved into Anatolia, they already probably found a sitting indigenous population. And they spoke a language, Hattian as we call it, that was neither in the European, it's not Semitic, it has nothing to do with Sumerian, and cannot be linked to any of the other known ancient languages. So we call it a linguistic isolate. Hattian too is only known from the royal tablet collections of the later Hittite kingdom, um, but there are not that many texts, so on the whole it is very poorly known. So that brings me to the end of the first section, Hittite as an Indo-European language. I don't know whether there are already any questions that I might be able to answer. Uh, so, so far there's no questions. There's just hellos from uh, people, many of whom uh, are friends. So, so there's Stephen Housen, there's Joel Arbeitmann, Pippa Stiele, Brennan Ramsey, Julia Campbell, Paolo, Sylvie Donat, Matteo Vigo from Mainz, Tate Paulette from Rayleigh, Martin Kummel, Nej Rochon, Stephanie Selover, Max Gender, and T. Kita. So far, no questions, but they okay. might uh, aggregate later. Sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, so then let's move on to the prehistory of Hittite. That is, you may remember from one of my first slides that I had as the time frame that we are talking about tonight, I had the year 2000 BC between parentheses and then 1650 through 1200. That 1650 through 1200 is really the historical period uh, from which we have all those 30,000 plus sources. But we actually know that in the European speakers speaking Hittite and Luwian were already present in Anatolia before 1650. And uh, so let's talk about how we know that. Um, around 2000, 
merchants from Assyria in northern Mesopotamia set up a trading network of a network of trading posts or trading colonies as they are also mentioned in central Anatolia. And here you see uh, the names of the major posts or hubs, trading hubs that were there and the uh, routes along which the merchants traveled with their goods. They um, usually came to export to northern Mesopotamia copper, also silver and gold and textiles. And what they brought that the Anatolians were interested in was mainly tin for the making of bronze because we are in the Bronze Age here. The center of that commercial network of these Assyrian merchants uh, was the town of Kanesh that you see here under the uh, arrow. And from there, with that as the sort of spider in the web, the merchants did their work. At that moment, as part of that network, so between 2000 and about 1720, Hattusha, the later Hittite capital Hattusha, under the name Hattus, was already was one of the small trading posts and was already in uh, existence. These Assyrian merchants came to Anatolia with their own language and cuneiform script. You see an example from the Oriental Institute Museum right here on your screen. Most of these old Assyrian texts were written between 1900 and 1835 with some dating to the later period. And right now we have about, we have over 23,000 records that those merchants left behind. They are contracts with the local authorities. They are uh, contracts with local people that they dealt with. Uh, they are correspondence with their families back home. And of course, in those documents, we find uh, already references to local people. We know that marriages, existed between Assyrian merchants and local Anatolian women. So we find personal names. We also find some loan words from the local languages. And these personal names and loan words make clear that there were already speakers of the Anatolian branch of Indo-European languages um, there. It was around the middle of the 18th century, around 1750, let's say that a, uh, a king, Pitkhana, and his son, Anitta, from this general area, Kushara, as you can see here, uh, we don't know where it was located exactly, but it must have been roughly in this area. They invaded, they moved to Kanesh, the center of the trading network, took it and made that into their new power base. Um, and they started there, uh, uh, from there building what we can call the first uh, unified Hittite kingdom. Um, Anitta is uh, a uh, historical person. Uh, we find, uh, for example, uh, we have this little tablet, a docket of some kind with the name Anita right there. And we also have this spear point uh, of bronze. And maybe you can see there's a little inscription here. You find it enlarged on the bottom of your screen. And that says, Palace of Anita the King. Now, I've always found this kind of a puzzling inscription. It is clearly not, let's say, a ceremonial spear that was dedicated to Anita, which then you would expect to say for or to Anita the king. No, it says palace of Anita the king. And it seems, however we look at it, to be a typical form of uh, early script usage uh, where you put your name on uh, everything. And uh, as I said, I've often been uh, puzzled by uh, this, but I recently, just eight days ago, I found what I think might be a nice parallel. It was an article in the New York Times of January 20th of this year. Uh, it was an article about 
what is now the former first lady of the United States, who, as you may know, didn't feel very comfortable at first uh, as first lady and only later came to the White House. And so when coming in, when starting to live in the White House, she made a number of uh, accommodations updates. And the article said the updates, oh, I'm sorry, the updates were meant to make life in the White House more functional for the first family and their visitors. One design choice involved embossing balls in the bowling alley with the phrase, the president's house. So here too, you could say an early literacy, uh, early uh, type of script usage uh, in modern times. As I said before, Anita is clearly a historical figure due to that docket that I showed you and the spear point, but we also know him and we know him mainly through the later Hittite tablet collections when the Hittite, the, the next Hittite kingdom started around 1650. Because we have, as you can see here, uh, on the left, the obverse, and on the right, the reverse of a tablet that we know, a composition that we know as the Anitta text. It contains, you could say, a, an account by Anitta of his race geste, his exploits in making, in forming, in building this first Hittite um, kingdom. And in that text, he says, these words on a tablet in or at my gate. <laughs> of course, tablets are always broken, so the verb is broken away. What it makes clear, apart from that little tablet that I already showed you in the spear point, is that he apparently already started writing these words on a tablet, and he already used tablets. And whether he deposited the tablet at his gate or whether he uh, displayed it for everybody to see in a larger inscription at his gate, we don't know, but it is clear that he started using writing. And so the big question is, in what script and language did Anita write down this composition about his exploits, his race geste? And I think we have three options here. He could have used the old Assyrian language and script, that is a possibility. And you see another example, but now in a hand drawing of a typical old Assyrian tablet. The second option is he used his own language, Hittite, but wrote in the old Assyrian script. I think that is not very likely because we have no parallel for this, apart from the personal names in the old Assyrian records uh, and some local loan words, there is not a text that shows that local Hittite speaking people were writing their own language in this foreign script. And then the third option might be that he wrote it in Hittite, but then in what would be a forerunner of the later Hittite cuneiform, form, what we will then call as of 1650, the typical Hittite cuneiform. form. For that too, there is, I think, no real evidence. Scholars have pointed at just a handful, maybe two or three tablets that have been found among the old Assyrian tablets that are not in the old Assyrian cuneiform form script, but in the then current Syrian cuneiform. form. But they are letters that were sent from Syria to Kanesh to people who apparently could read that kind of cuneiform, which was very different from the old Assyrian cuneiform. And I think though that is not enough evidence uh, to claim that. So I think um, I think we have to uh, go for the first option that Anita used the old Assyrian language and script, just as he did it on that little uh, tablet that I showed you at first, and as we also see it on the spear point. So we have to conclude that although the Anatolians lived in close quarters for actually over 200 years um, with these Assyrian merchants, and I told you already that there were 
marriages between Assyrians and local Anatolian women, the local population in Anatolia does not seem to have been very eager to start writing and to start writing in, and certainly not starting writing in their own uh, language. They had for uh, ages, for centuries, um, done their own trading and regulated their relations within Anatolia in non-written ways, in completely oral ways. And although they must have observed the local Anatolians, uh, the local, the, the, the Assyrian merchants writing, um, they did not wholesale adopt uh, that technology. There are uh, some uh, old Assyrian tablets that clearly were written by local people, uh, but on the whole that came late and it uh, and the numbers are uh, very low. And so I think um, we have to observe with Rosalind Thomas in her article on functional literacy and democratic literacy in Greece, that for literacy to take root in a society, it has to have meaning. It needs to have obvious and valuable uses to be relevant or empowering in some way. And it needs to be in a language that is actually used by the people learning to read. So I think that it, that explains the late part in the title of um, my talk tonight. Are there so far any questions? I, I don't see any questions. Please ask your questions in the chat if you have any. Well, so if there's no questions, I'll just abuse my position and make a, slide, a very short comment. Uh, your last observation it reminds me a bit of the situation in Kerma in, in Nubia, also around the same time, roughly first half of the second millennium BC. So these people in Kerma in Nubia, they're in contact with Egypt. They know that there is such a thing as writing. Um, and yet they do not adopt it because, well, it's not socially meaningful, etc. all the, the things that you mentioned. So that's in a parallel for a situation of being in contact and writing, uh, knowing about it, and yet not adopting it. Just a comment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. No, that's, that's in, indeed a very interesting uh, parallel. Thank you. Okay, then let's move to Hattusa, the, what then later becomes the Hittite capital, and see how they uh, fared with uh, the script technology. So the around as um, around 1650, we suddenly see what was formerly a little trading hub, Hattus. We suddenly see that uh, as the seat of a whole new Hittite kingdom, small at first, but soon expanding. And the first three kings that we meet there are Labarna, Hattusili the first and Morsley the first with the years that I have indicated here. One of the first things these early three kings of the new Hittite kingdom do is they turn their eyes eastwards and southwards to what is then of course the civilized center or the center of the civilized world, Mesopotamia. And in particular, they look at Northern Syria. In, and they do so in order to establish their kingdom and to strengthen their kingdom and to expand it. And they try to incorporate uh, the strategically important area of Syria into their uh, new kingdom. And they are especially looking at the kingdom of Yamhat, which you see in the circle there with uh, its capital Aleppo uh, and to, the, to its west, the local satellite of Alalah. And uh, Alalah is then, and Aleppo are both destroyed and taken by those kings. And it seems um, evident that they import, so to speak, deport, one should probably say, uh, local Syrian scribes with them to Anatolia. And they start to write, they start uh, giving these originally Syrian scribes uh, 
things to write that are uh, important to these new uh, Hittite kings, the old Hittite kings. And the, when we look at the early pieces of writing, uh, we can characterize them as monumental on the one hand and as ownership markings, uh, ownership marking. Think of the bowling balls of the White House. Hattusili I, the second king of the little list that I gave you, uh, for example, uh, writes or has scribes writing for him his res geste, his annals, and he puts them on a statue of gold, uh, as he say, and I made myself this statue of gold. And um, so that is uh, a very early monumental piece of writing. But he writes that very likely in Akkadian. We have two versions of that text. We have an Akkadian version, which is difficult to date paleographically. And we have a Hittite version of it, which is a late copy. Um, so that is one piece. The other one, another uh, sample of writing from this period is uh, a ceremonial axe that you see here of a king of about a uh, hundred years later, 1550, King Amuna, who in the inscription here that runs vertically here, but you see it horizontally uh, represented there in the middle of this slide, uh, he says, or the inscription says, Tabarna, which is an old Hittite royal title, Tabarna Amuna, great king, Whoever violates his just word will die. So these are two early pieces of writing, both in Akkadian. That inscription on the X is in Akkadian. And other pieces of early writing, early compositions that we see in that same first hundred years of the kingdom, uh, we can characterize as ad memoir. Uh, for example, that same Hattusili, uh, of which I gave a quote from his annals, his res geste. Um, we also have of him a political testament, as we call it, in which he introduces his grandson as his successor, and he also addresses his grandson. And he says there, I have given you my advice, and this tablet they shall read before you every month. That text too, we have both in an Akkadian version and in a Hittite version. The other example of text as an ad memoir is the, comes from the proclamation, as we call it, of King Telepinu uh, in the 16th century, where he introduces new rules for royal succession because the Hittite kings before him have made a mess of it. There has been a lot of bloodshed and killing in the dynasty and he wants to put an end to it. And he says there, furthermore, whoever becomes king and seeks evil for his brother and sister, you, the people that he addresses in this proclamation, you shall be his family counsel and you must tell that person forthright, read this record of bloodshed on the tablet where you can read where it says, in the past bloodshed had become frequent in Hattusa and the gods took revenge on the royal family. So there too, he urges people to, when something has happened, to go back to this, this composition, this text that he has written in order to inform themselves what should be done. As I already mentioned, so in that first hundred years we have quite a few compositions uh, of which we have both an Akkadian and a Hittite version. But if we look at documents of which we are certain that they were written in, that they were manufactured, so to speak, in that first hundred years, then they are all uh, in the Akkadian language, not yet in uh, Hittite. So I think that as is typologically very normal, that the new Hittites of the kingdom starting in 1650, they imported writing from Syria. They had totally forgotten about the old Assyrian cuneiform that 
their forebears were once familiar with. Um, and so they adopt this new script. And again, just like their forebears with old Assyrian, they start at first writing in the language that comes with the script. That is the Syrian dialect of uh, Akkadian. Now, how does that work? Um, when we go back to that one quote that I gave you, where Hattushili addresses his grandson, and he says, I have given you my advice, and this tablet they shall read before you every month. How did that work? Did the boy know Akkadian? Probably not. Uh, but we have to remember that at this point, there were, there must have been Syrian scribes working in Hattusa, maybe already having become part of Anatolian society. And in those first few generations, uh, that must have led to some, uh, to bilingual scribes, ver uh, versant, conversant, both in Akkadian and in the local uh, Hittite language. And so what may have happened is uh, what we see here from, or what Michael Clancy tells in his book From Memory to Written Record about medieval England between 1066 and 1307, where he says, a statement made in court in English or French, for example, might be written down in Latin, or conversely, a Latin charter might be read out in English or French. Men like Abbot Samson evidently interchanged languages effort effortlessly using whichever one was appropriate for the occasion. A royal message to a sheriff in the 13th century might have been spoken by the king in French, written out in Latin, and then read out to the recipient in English. And I could imagine a similar situation um, um, having uh, been the case in, uh, in Hattusa in uh, the first hundred years. Um, that seems that situation seems to have changed in the 16th century, around or around the middle of the 16th century. It's difficult to date it exactly. The 16th century shows a number of very incisive changes. Originally, uh, in the time of Labarna, Hattusili the first, Morsli the first, the Hittite capital. Uh, was small, as you see it here uh, on the left in this picture on, on the right. This was, so it was a small uh, area. But in the 16th century, that changed. The uh, local kings uh, doubled, more than doubled, the extent of the capital. They uh, built walls around this southern extension. They started building temples and big buildings here. We see in that same period around the middle of the uh, 16th century, also in the periphery, city foundations, foundations of new settlements. So there was a, uh, a very strong development in the Hittite uh, kingdom at that moment. And part of those changes may also have affected um, the or may have caused the switch from writing in Akkadian to writing in Hittite. One of the signs of that may be the, what we sometimes refer to as the Hittite law code. The Hittite law code was no doubt very long in the making, but it, but it was not until King Telepinu uh, of around, we have already seen him with his proclamation, so he lived in the, let's say, the second half of that 16th century, who for the first time systematized and put together, wrote together these laws on a tablet. And the interesting thing is that so far we have all those old Hittite compositions of which we have both an Akkadian and a Hittite version. Of the Hittite laws, we only have Hittite versions. It is probably the Hittite text with the most duplicates, the most copies. Hittite texts were copied time and again. But among those copies, there is not a single one that shows that there was ever a Akkadian language version of the laws. So 
I would think that, or I would contend that the Hittite law code is the first datable Hittite only text from the reign of Telepinu. I have to insert here, by the way, that uh, several of the things that I'm telling you tonight uh, are my opinion. Uh, not all my colleagues uh, agree on with everything that I'm saying. So don't believe me uh, in every respect. But uh, so for example, there are also Hittithologists who believe that the Hittite laws in the form that I've shown you here, or that I'm showing you here, uh, already go back to, let's say, Hattusili the first. I don't believe that. I side with the editor of the standard edition of the laws, Professor Harry Hoffner, my predecessor here at Chicago, in dating um, the law code as we have it to Telepinu in the second half of the 16th century. It is time then to go to um, yeah, the adaptation, you. but maybe there are already questions. Yes, there, there's a couple of questions. Uh, well, uh, Virginia Hermann says, Hi, Theo, joining from Tübingen. And then there's a couple of questions. One by Vera Tsukanova, a question from Ilya Jakubovic. Hi, Ilya, by the way. So the question is, uh, when could the Anita text be translated into Hittite? Yeah. Uh, hi to Virginia and to Ilya. Uh, thanks for your uh, question. Um, I would Thing, but again, uh, this is the moment to say that not everybody agrees with me. Uh, I would think because uh, I believe that the Anita text was first written in Old Assyrian, um, in the Old Assyrian script, that it must have been translated early by these first, in the time probably of these first three kings, uh, or maybe even by the kings of the... Um, of the 16th century up to Telepinu, um, they may have seen the Anita text, which must have, which may have existed in an oral version up to then, as uh, important as a foundational text of their new Hittite kingdom. Uh, in this first hundred years, the Hittite kingdom that started with Labarna. Um, wanted to establish itself, wanted to give itself no doubt a, a history. And Anitta, as the king of the very first unified Hittite kingdom, uh, may have been the, uh, the right example for them. So I would see, uh, so I think the translation of the Anitta text into Hittite uh, must have happened somewhere in the first hundred years uh, of the Hittite kingdom. And so, so there's two more. Uh, I, I first give you the one that is more like a direct uh, follow up by Virginia Hermann. What changed between Anita and Hattusili that made the latter want to have scribes in his employ? Do you attribute this just to emulation of the Syrian kingdoms or to something internal? Uh, probably a combination. Uh, I think these early these th these, these three early kings Labarna Hattusili Morshili uh, in wanting to expand their empire towards as I said what was then the center of the civilized world Mesopotamia they first needed to correspond with local kings and we know they did we have actually a letter of either Labarna or Hattusili in. Akkadian in the Syrian dialect of Akkadian written to a local king in northern Syria. Um, they probably also felt that it they owed it to their prestige as a the new kid on the block, so to speak, uh, to acquire the um, the technology of writing. So it was both expediency, wanting to be able to converse with other powers in Northern Mesopotamia uh, in their own um, communication medium. Um, and also it no doubt gave them the prestige that they wanted. Think also back of the, the gold statue of Hattusili that he made of himself with, um, uh, with his uh, raised geste 
on it. Uh, that was clearly a piece of local propaganda, uh, see me being important and being very modern in using uh, writing. And one more uh, from, um, yes, from Vera Le Monnier, uh, in French I translate. Hello, I'd like to know to, to what point, to what degree the social status was impacting the different languages in Hittite Anatolia. Did several languages coexist as a function of social status? Uh, that's a very interesting question, but also extremely difficult to answer, uh, and, uh, and, and I may get back to that. Um, as we will see, um, and as we get into section four about adaptation of the Syrian script to write actually the, their own Hittite language, um, we will see that Hittite became the official medium of this kingdom. Um, but at the same time, the kings of this kingdom were clearly also interested in, for whatever reason, we can talk about that later on, um, in the languages and cultures elsewhere in Anatolia, mostly in European, but also this Hattian language, as I mentioned. Um, to what extent that um, mattered to, for example, social stratification within the kingdom, I don't think that's an, a question that we can answer. Um, but there was an awareness uh, on the part of these kings of other, of speakers of different languages with their probably accompanying cultures and customs and so forth. And, um, um, and, a, and an urge to incorporate those texts or the texts of some texts of those cultures um, into the uh, royal tablet archives. But we'll come back to that question, I think. Yeah, so no, no further question for now. Okay, so then assuming this switch from writing mostly Akkadian as is typologically, as I said before, very normal to finally take uh, using that originally foreign script to write their own language. Um, it may have been made, I think, uh, in the uh, second half of the 16th century. I showed you uh, the, the, the laws of that I think can be dated to say the Pino. Now, how does one, one do that? How do you adapt a foreign script to your own script? Obviously, the Semitic Akkadian that had come with the cuneiform script from Syria had a very different phonological system than uh, the Indo-European Hittite. And as an example, we can look at, for example, uh, how the Hittite scribes at that point totally ignored the voiced versus voiceless opposition that was offered by the Mesopotamian cuneiform. Apparently in Akkadian, there was this phonological opposition between voice and voiceless that was also reflected in their script. Um, instead, the Hittite scribes created something new, a new systematic opposition from the very beginning of double versus single spelled consonants. So to give you an example, an infinitive meaning to eat could be written as a, da, anna, remember that cuneiform was a syllabic script, or it could be written, so a, da, anna with the voiced da sign, but it could also be written, you can also encounter it written with the ta sign, a, ta, anna. That doesn't matter, both mean simply to eat. However, if you double those dentals in the syllabic script and you write a, da, anna, at, Ta ana, that means something totally different and the father in an accusative singular. Possibly this new create, newly created opposition of double versus single spelled consonants expressed something like what we call long versus short consonants. Uh, and for the phenomenon of long versus short consonants, you can think of English bookkeeping where you pronounce the K just a little bit longer than 
the single K in B keeping. So that was one thing. They had to uh, adapt the script to fit their phonological system. But those same scribes who did that also simplified the cuneiform script as it, as it was imported from Syria. For example, um, we have the two signs sha and ta. In, if we look at tablets from Alalakh in northern Syria, they have those same signs, but the sign sha can occur with one inscribed vertical, as you see it here, with two, as you see it here, sometimes with no inscribed vertical, sometimes with three horizontals. It's, we would say, it's a little bit of a mess. Uh, but if you are used to that writing system, it doesn't really bother you. The context usually will make clear whether you need to read a sha or a ta. Now, the Hittite scribes, learning that system, uh, did away with that uh, syst uh, yeah, asystematic uh, system. And so they, uh, from the very beginning, uh, standardized the signs. And so they made a rule, Sha always has one inscribed vertical and Ta two. Um, in a similar way, it is very normal in Mesopotamia, in Mesopotamia cuneiform, that one cuneiform sign, like you see, for example, here, can have several multiple readings. For example, the sign that you see here can be read U, Ud, Pir, Tam, Babar, or Utu. And normally, the context will help you in uh, choosing which sound value you need to read in a given line or in a given text. But for these Hittite scribes who had to uh, learn this script as a new script, that was too much to ask. So they uh, very largely uh, reduced that polyphony, as we call it, in the uh, cuneiform script. So in Hittite, it still uh, exists to a certain extent, but it is much, much reduced compared to the local Mesopotamian uh, cuneiform. Another, I think, very interesting introduction that the Hittite scribes made was the introduction of word space. Um, in Mesopotamia, they didn't do that. If you look at a cuneiform tablet from Syria, it is one massive block usually of cuneiform uh, signs and word spaces are, in principle, are, are not there. Um, now, again, if you are used to it, if that's your system, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we could easily, in English, uh, get used to an absence of uh, word space. Um, but for the Hittite scribes, uh, that was another thing that they did away with, and so they introduced word space. Relatively, the, at first, the script is still looks relatively dense, but very soon you see, you can easily recognize, even if you don't know cuneiform, you can spot where the spaces between words are. Another thing is that Hittite, one of the most characteristic things of the Hittite language is that it was very rich in clitics, that is, small grammatical morphemes attached to the first word of a clause. For example, you may encounter, again in syllabic writing, you may encounter this sequence, machan ma which consists of the first word of the sentence, which is the conjunction machan when, and it is followed by five Clitics, five separate grammatical elements that each carry a specific point of information. Ma um, is something like however. Uh, wa indicates that it is part of a direct speech. The du part means you or to you or for you. Za we usually describe as a reflexive particle, although that doesn't cover it all, of course. And finally, there's the sentence particle, as we call it, con, of which, frankly, we don't really know how it worked. And this shows 
because the Hittite scribes wrote this as one unit, it also shows a, how in adapting the cuneiform script from Syria to start writing in Hittite, that it, it affected a linguistic awareness of the, or that it needed, it asked for uh, a linguistic awareness of their own language. They wrote this all together without word space, but after the com, the final element, there is a word space and then comes the next word. Because these clitics, usually they are attached to the words and carry no accent themselves. They are attached to the first accent bearing element, which was here the conjunction machan. Machan marutskan, pause, and then the next word. And so in so these word, word spaces uh, also reflect a uh, linguistic awareness. Um, and then finally, there is interestingly uh, an expansion they made themselves of the cuneiform system, but using the tools that the system gave them. What I mean is the following. Um, Akkadian didn't have an F sound, a labial fricative, th. But the Hittites needed it. I'll come back to this point in a moment. Uh, what they did was they took the familiar cuneiform sign that they read as wa, they added the cuneiform sign a, made it subscript under the horizontal of the wa sign, and that created the new sound for them, fa. And they made a sequence. So this is fa, this is fu. Fo, fe. So using the system, they created new signs with new sound values. But the striking thing is that uh, Hittite itself, the Hittite language, didn't have an F. So they didn't create it to write Hittite texts. They did create it for Palaic texts and Hattian texts, because the Palaic language and the Hattian language did have an F phoneme. And uh, so this shows that from the very beginning, because we find these new signs from the very beginning of Old Hittite writing, that uh, they created these signs to record languages other than Hittite. They were, and so this comes a little bit back to the question of, I think, Madame Le Monnier, um, that they, um, they already, there was an interest in recording languages, texts, compositions in uh, languages other than Hittite for whatever reason, probably political reasons, maybe also in the beginning, maybe also already scholarly reasons, although that may come later, uh, but we can see that it was happening. There was an interest in these other languages and cultures reflecting in, reflected in the um, uh, royal archives of the Hittite capital. Are there any more questions? Yes, uh, just uh, an another question from Ilya Yakubovich. Uh, what is the likely age of the cushion shaped tablets claimed to be the earliest Hittite cuneiform documents? Um, the cushion shaped tablets, I think then you refer to what we usually, uh, what are called the Landschenkungsurkunden, the land deeds. Um, they are actually you could say relatively late in the sense that I follow uh, Gernot Wilhelm in uh, dating the earliest uh, of these land deeds uh, to Telepinu, maybe a predecessor, Hosea. Um, um, so around, so in the second half of the 15th, uh, 16th century, um, and they, it's, it's interesting, these uh, land deeds uh, are indeed very specific in both in form and in formulary. They, they, um, these are 
ju um, yeah, judicial records, you could say they are land deeds. The king bestows large properties of real estate and land to uh, probably mostly uh, members of his own dynasty. Um, and they are written in a Akkadian formulary, which is tied to, um, uh, with some uh, ref reformations, so to speak, with, um, um, tied already to, there are some links to Northern Syria. So it was partly an existing formulary uh, that they adopted. And so these were always written in, um, in Akkadian, although uh, we see uh, Hittite words popping up in these texts, uh, especially for technical terms uh, or terms for describing local phenomena for which these scribes, uh, who probably no longer may not have spoken Akkadian, uh, didn't know the Akkadian word. So they knew the formulary of the so the basic framing framing of these documents, uh, but they filled it in with Hittite loan words or Hittite words, I should say, not loan words, Hittite words um, whenever it was needed and they didn't know the Akkadian word. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I hope so. Any other questions? There's no further question now. Okay, well, so now the Hittites have made the switch from writing in Akkadian to writing everything in Hittite, at least anything internal. Of course, they would still use Akkadian for correspondence with people in Mesopotamia, for treaties that they concluded with kings there, but for internal purposes, it was now only Hittite. And so what, did they then write down? Here I give you a very rough dichotomy of Hittite texts. We can distinguish between short-term texts and long-term texts. Um, and I owe this division to Willemijn Baal from her uh, book on uh, Hittite uh, diplomatics. Uh, the Short-term texts are what you could call all administrative in the wider sense of the word. We have uh, correspondence, we have inventories of luxury goods in the royal storerooms, uh, we have a judicial text to court depositions, we have cult inventories that kind of list and regulate the local cults in the periphery of central Anatolia, uh, we have oracles, we have vows. So, but these texts were apparently, <clears throat> excuse me, they were apparently discarded as soon as they had lost their administrative relevance. Um, and that is reflected in the fact that normally we only have these texts from the 13th century, maybe even only the last 50, 75 years of the Hittite kingdom. So we normally don't have older texts from these genres, as opposed to the long-term texts, which are more where we find the narrative texts, uh, be it historiography, uh, treaties, um, uh, instructions to professional groups, the Hittite laws I've already mentioned. We have indigenous Anatolian mythology, hymns and prayers, and uh, also the Hattian and Palaic compositions for which they invented the F signs, uh, Luwian texts, and then in general also uh, texts from outside Anatolia that they imported for uh, probably originally at the behest of the king, uh, but soon there may have formed a group of people who had more, you could say, scholarly or academic interests in these kinds of foreign compositions. So these are the texts, roughly the texts that filled those, uh, that make up the 30,000 plus tablets that we have. Now, a few years ago, I read the book that I show here by Dennis Feeney, Beyond Greek, The Beginnings of Latin Literature, and that made me aware of something that I um, never quite realized. And that is that 
it is not always a given, not always to be taken for granted that a society that starts writing, writes down its own literature. For example, we don't have any old Persian epics or what have you, uh, fictional literature um, in the old Persian script and language. Uh, the Etruscans, when they adopted the Greek alphabet, for all we know, they never wrote down their own literature. Uh, the Phrygians and so forth. Uh, think of also uh, the Greeks in the Mycenaean era. Uh, we have those thousands of linear B tablets, all strict bookkeeping, but not yet anything um, of a narrative fictional kind. And um, so in his book, uh, Beyond Greek, uh, Feeney describes the, the S, the under, as the subtitle says, the beginnings of Latin literature, um, how the early Romans first started writing in Greek, the script or the language that came with the script originally, and how they started with, uh, then when they started writing their own language, started with translations, and then finally also made the step to writing their own uh, Latin Liter literature. That step was also made by the Hittites. For example, we have the story of Mr. Apu. Uh, the text starts as follows. In the background, you see the tablet. I hope it's still legible, but the text will come back. Uh, there once was a town named Sugu. It lies in the land of Luluai on the border of the sea, and in it lives a man named Mr. Apu. In the land, he is wealthy, he owns cattle and sheep lots of them. Now, the, um, it has, uh, no, let me tell a little bit more about Mr. Apu. So Mr. Apu, uh, so he may, for all his wealth, he is a very tragic person because he cannot get children. He is unable to sire children with his wife. And so in the end, in desperation, he turns to the sun deity for help and uh, he helps Apu get children. And at first he gets a son and Apu is still very annoyed at the fact that he couldn't get children in a normal way. So he calls his first son bad or evil. And then he gets a second son once he knows how to do it. And he calls that son good. And this is sort of a Cain and Abel theme. And indeed the brother evil lives up to his name. So this seems to be sort of one of those universal motifs, literary motifs. And scholars have tried to think, so where can we trace the origins of this story? And what you usually do then is you look at the, at the names. Can we find some linguistic identification in the name Sugu or Luluwai or the name Apu? And it has been suggested, for example, that this may be originally a Hurrian story, but there are no really good arguments for it. Well, I think that on the one hand, this was a, um, a motif that may not have been original to Anatolia, uh, that may have existed elsewhere. But I do think that a Hittite audience um, recognized those names, could, saw puns in those names. Sudul, for example, can be recognized as a verbal noun to a verb that means uh, sealing a, a storage jar in which you put your seasonal goods to be able to open later on when you need it. Luluwai must have been, must have sounded familiar to a Hittite audience uh, because of the verb luluwai, which means to thrive, to prosper. And the name of Mr. Apu comes back in the Hittite word for fat, Apuzi. So to them, the story may have sounded like there once was a town named Fulton. It lies in the land of Prosperia on the border of the sea, and in it lives a man named Mr. Rich. In the land he is wealthy, he owns cattle and sheep, lots of them. So the story, this no doubt not original, originally Anatolian motif was domesticated, so to speak, 
uh, into what may have seemed to a Hittite audience as a story from their own culture. We see the same thing very clearly happening also in the fairy tale of the Queen of Kanesh. There once was a queen in Kanesh. Kanesh, you may remember, was this original center of the uh, Assyrian trading network. Uh, the Queen of Kanesh, uh, who once gave birth to 30 sons in one session, so to speak. Uh, and she was so horrified at the experience and at what she had born that she took those 30 little boys, those baby boys, put them in little baskets in a river and had them flow off. This, of course, is the, the theme, the Kinder aus Zetzung motif that we know from Moses, from Romulus and Remus, from Cyrus. It's, it's one of those uh, well-known um, literary motifs. And, uh, and here too, the story is domesticated. It is put in a very specific Anatolian uh, context. So it is appropriated to the own culture. So Hittites wrote down their own uh, literature. And later on, we may say that uh, for example, historiography, the historiography, the Hittite historiography by a later Morsili around 1300 has often been in literature, in secondary literature, been praised for its, people have used terms like journalistic qualities, it's between quotes objectivity. What they want to say is how in Egypt it, or in Mesopotamia, if kings um, account their, their conquests and so forth, it is all hyperbole and it is straightforwardly, um, unabashedly propaganda. But that, you cannot say that of the historiography written by Morshley. It is indeed, it comes, comes close to being journalistic. And he not only, he does praise his own role, but he also praises the role of his commanders. And uh, so that has uh, also a, or has been ascribed by others, uh, certain literary qualities. Okay. Um, so I just showed you those uh, groups of Hittite texts. Um, I think in the end, we can conclude that all those 30,000 plus preserved cuneiform texts from the Hittite royal archives from the capital. They are the records of the Hittite state generated by the chancellery of that state. The overwhelming majority of those records focusing on the king and his role in that state. That is the, if you want to generally characterize what we have, that is it. And I add immediately that there is no evidence, as far as I'm concerned, but there are other opinions around, there is no evidence that cuneiform and clay tablets were ever used outside government circles. As I said, it was the official medium, Hittite and the cuneiform script were the official medium of the state, but internally within the royal elite. And it's interesting to observe that there are, for example, also no publicly displayed monuments bearing cuneiform inscriptions in Hittite. If you go to Turkey nowadays in Anatolia and visit several sites, you will not see any rock reliefs with uh, cuneiform inscriptions in Hittite uh, on them. And that brings us to the next sections on the second script, but maybe there are questions. Yes, there are. Uh, so first there's an hello, Theo, from Adiego from Barcelona. And then we have two questions. The first is by Max Kander. Uh, can we be sure that the Persians, Etruscans, Phrygians did not have literature? Or could this be due to the literature being recorded on perishable materials? Or more generally, on which grounds can we decide if there was literature in a specific language or not? Thank you. That's a great question because it reminds me that I have forgotten to say something important. That is, no doubt, all those literatures, the, or, or all those um, societies, the Etruscans, the Persians, uh, whoever, uh, they 
may very well have had a rich oral culture. But as far as we can tell from the evidence that we have, they didn't write that down. And I must say, and that will come back in the next, or yeah, in the next sections, uh, I'm always uncomfortable with the assumption of, oh, then they wrote that down on perishable material. Um, why, if they wrote some things down on, on clay, on metal, on whatever materials, why for the other things that we might expect from them, would they have chosen perishable materials? Um, I think we have to let the evidence speak for itself. Um, instead, I mean, I know that people say absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That's true, uh, maybe in many cases. But I also we have also think that we have to seriously consider the possibility that if we have no or almost no evidence for something, we should seriously consider the possibility that maybe it didn't exist in that way. So again, uh, I'm sure those other societies did have a rich oral culture of, of stories, of myths and so forth. Probably every um, society uh, has that. But I don't think we have enough evidence to say that they wrote it down. And a second question by Andrea Balletta. Um, so I, yes. To which extent and through which specific topoi is the Horian influence on Hittite literature evident or recognizable? Um, there is um, quite a bit of um, Hurrian uh, literary culture, let's say, in within our texts. Um, there is this, for example, a whole series of texts around uh, what we call the, the, the theogony. So as we know from Hesiod in ancient Greek literature, so the fight among the gods for the uh, ultimate uh, king, so like Zeus became the, uh, the upper deity in, in Greece. So in the Hittite situation, the storm god, we have a whole yeah, a series of tablets that describe that, but they clearly come from a Hurrian milieu. Um, so those texts were very well known uh, in the capital and among the scribes. Um, not too long ago in the 1980s, I think it was, uh, we found in the Hittite capital um, the what we call the Hurrian Hittite bilingual uh, with mythological parts and wisdom literature parts, biblical like uh, parables, for example. Um, they, um, they, uh, so they existed in the Hittite uh, capital, but we don't really know what their function uh, was. They were sometimes uh, also copied many times, translated into Hittite, um, but they remained, they retained their Hurrian character. Um, how far that influence went, we don't know. Um, I think that since they are part of those, of that corpus of cuneiform records, um, that I think didn't go beyond royal circles. I don't think this Horian culture spread further than or went beyond uh, the ruling elite. I hope that kind of answers your question. And uh, in the meantime, one more by Vera Le Monnier. Um, so, uh, by, by what means uh, would they make the propaganda that you were speaking of uh, credible? Uh, do we have any evidence for an uh, awakening of uh, awareness among local populations relative to the propaganda of the of those in charge of governing? Right. Um, well, I um, on the one hand, um, we know that Hittite kings 
traveled through central Anatolia quite a bit, um, endowing uh, local cults with gifts of all kinds. Uh, so that's, of course, a form of propaganda. Um, I also think that there may have been a culture of reading out loud. Um, but the, the, the third kind of answer comes in the next section um, that I've called a second script. So um, if you allow me, I will go there. And, I, and if you uh, have further questions, I'd love to hear them. So the cuneiform, as I said, was restricted, in my opinion, to the, uh, the ruling elite and their very limited circles. And it didn't spread to the local population. Now, from the old Assyrian period uh, and onwards, we see that in local communities, there they used symbols. For example, I have here on the left two seal impressions with uh, here an animal head, here a vase of some kind, and maybe another something else um, that very likely um, were read, so to speak, by others uh, and identified then as belonging to an individual or an office, and that had a function, these seal impressions with these symbols within, a, uh, within an administrative system. We see those symbols returning or continuing, I should say, continuing in the old Hittite period. And on the right, I have here a seal impression with a ligature of two symbols to what we would later call hieroglyphic signs, uh, a combination of Ha and Li, as you see here. Li is the dagger. Uh, pierced through this Ga sign. And we know from later cuneiform texts or from cuneiform texts that Ga Li uh, is also used as an abbreviation of the name Hatusili. This is not necessarily, by the way, the old Hirat king, but the, I mean, there were more Hatusilis around. Um, but what we do see here is how those same symbols that we already recognize here and there in the iconography of the old Assyrian period, that they continue into uh, the Hittite historical period, and that they start developing sound values like the Ga and the Li. The earliest example of that points at the existence of a writing system using these symbols into a hieroglyphic script system. We call it hieroglyphs because of the Egyptian example, but I don't think they have anything to do with each other. The first example that there may have existed already a full-fledged syllabic system using these uh, signs is this seal, where down the middle we can read sa, ta, tu, ga, pa, to write the name of a queen, Satandu Gapa. And this dates to shortly after 1400. So I would, I think we can claim that at least during the 15th, uh, during the, uh, yes, 15th century, um, these symbols were gradually, or maybe less gradually, um, turned into a real writing system. And uh, Ilya Kobovic has, I think, convincingly shown how this was uh, a creation uh, both of Luwian and Hittite speakers and maybe originated within the Hittite royal circles. Um, and we then see in the 13th century, we see this exploding into um, a use of these uh, hieroglyphs uh, in a micro form in more seal impressions of which we have thousands. And you see here several examples. But we also see them in what one could call more a macro form uh, as captions in Hittite uh, visual culture. This relief here where a later King Hattusili pours a libation to uh, a god here. And here you see the hieroglyphs uh, identifying the king. Whoops, sorry. 
um, as Hattusili. And also we see in the Hittite capital and elsewhere, the erection of full-scale inscriptions, historical inscriptions recounting the deeds of Hittite kings. And this is the third part, uh, Miss Le Monnier, of the propaganda of Hittite uh, kings. And these texts are more straightforwardly propagandistic, I would say, as far as we have them, we don't have a lot. Um, but more than the, uh, the, the historiography of, of Morshili. But so that's what they were, uh, these hieroglyphs were used for. But the interesting thing now is that if you look at those Luwian inscriptions, the seals, of course, they bear only names and titles. So it's difficult to speak of languages there. But if we look at the large publicly displayed inscriptions, they are all in Luwian and not in Hittite. And that's an important uh, observation. So we can sort of set up a dichotomy of written languages and scripts. We have the Hittite language as the official medium of the Hittite state for its internal administration using the cuneiform script, writing on clay tablets, and that is all for internal administrative purposes. Whereas the hieroglyphs, the second script developed by the ruling elite, was used for Luwian, for monumental purposes, and publicly displayed. And that then, and that probably to anticipate something that we, I will say a little bit later, um, already points at probably the, certainly in the 13th century, when this becomes really prevalent, um, the local Anatolian population being largely Luwian speaking, not Hittite speaking. And I think that's the reason why they developed uh, this script and used it to write Luwian. Note also that the hieroglyphs um, reflect, because they are all recognized, or all, not at least not to us, but in general, recognizable images of people, of animals, of things, uh, furniture, what have you, uh, they reflected the Anatolian world as the people knew them. Uh, so they could recognize that as their script. Whereas the cuneiform, as far as they saw it, as a foreign import, uh, was totally abstract and didn't mean anything to them. Um, but okay, so but before we get there, uh, let's briefly look at script carriers. But first, maybe some questions. Uh, no question, just uh, to okay. Andrea Balletta, thanks you for the answer. And uh, Anustup Batasharia writes, it's almost like relevant the Hittites. Very interesting. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so let's have a brief look, as I said, at the um, uh, script carriers. So what were the writing materials? As I said already several times, cuneiform on clay, writing Hittite, that is the official medium of the Hittite state. Um, we have still not answered one very important question. I showed you these, oops, sorry. I showed you the, um, the short-term and the long-term texts. The long-term texts were more narrative and among them fictional texts. Short-term texts I described as largely administrative, sometimes straightforwardly bookkeeping in character. But if we look in Mes at Mesopotamia, you immediately wonder where is the socioeconomic administration? Where are adoption records, debt notes, contracts, court records? All those texts that are so normal and so ubiquitous and so amply attested in Mesopotamia. Don't we have them for Hittite society? No, it seems we don't. And this is again, and then I come back to the, uh, the, the, the question by uh, uh, Max Gander. Um, the usual answer by uh, many Hittitologists is, well, of course, Mesopotamia had them, the Hittites must have had those texts as well. Uh, but since we 
seems to there seems to be a total lack of the Mont cuneiform, they must have been written in perishable materials, like, for example, wax covered wooden tablets. You see here a replica of a Roman tabula, how that worked, um, wax uh, in, the, in the middle, and inscribe uh, an area that you can inscribe and then uh, with a nice hinge. We have only one example that uh, comes from the general area. This is a very small uh, wooden, uh, originally wooden writing tablet. Sorry, I don't know why that happens. Um, um, found in a shipwreck uh, that we know as the Uluburum shipwreck. It was found just off the southern coast of Turkey near Lycia. Um, it, uh, it's very small. You can see it in the Bodrum Maritime Museum. The inscribable area here in the middle is only something like seven by five centimeters, uh, but it clearly was used as uh, like a, a Roman wax tablet. Um, we don't know where the ship, the shipwreck in which it was found, where the ship came from, where it was headed. Uh, the cargo um, may also have come from several places. So it is uh, not certain to what culture, what society it belongs, but it shows that such tablets were around and were known. And indeed, we know from Mesopotamia, from Egypt, uh, and I showed you the replica of the Roman tablet, that wooden tablets with wax were used and were uh, around. Um, and there are, and I'm absolutely not, and but this is another point of controversy uh, within the field of hittithology, um, I'm not denying that wooden tablets existed and were used. There are indeed some words in Hittite cuneiform texts that seem to refer to wooden writing boards, but on the whole, their number is very, very low, I would say. Um, another thing that people use as an argument to argue for the uh, more widespread use of wooden tablets are uh, these objects that are interpreted of made of bronze uh, with a pointed end and a flattened end. Uh, they are interpreted as styli. And they are then uh, not suitable for cuneiform, but they would be very suitable to write the hieroglyphs in such wax covered tablets. Um, it's, it's possible. Absolutely. Um, and there are then people who think that uh, those wooden tablets that would be on which all those expected socioeconomic records would have been written, would have been written in hieroglyphs, not in cuneiform. Um, I have trouble believing that since um, if Mesopotamia was the example in this. In Mesopotamia, they were written in cuneiform um, on clay. Why would they change suddenly for these kinds of administration uh, for the wooden tablets? Whereas as we saw other kinds of administration like the palace inventories and so forth that are also late and short term were still written in cuneiform on clay. Um, and an extra, uh, an additional uh, problem is that, as we saw, there is a good argument to say that hieroglyphs were only used for Luwian. So do we then have to suppose that part of the administration and this socioeconomic administration was done in Luwian, whereas all the other texts were written in Hittite? Um, it's, there are a lot of problems here. Um, by the way, um, in other areas of the ancient Middle East, similar objects have been found and are sometimes interpreted as surgical instruments. So it's, it's, it's difficult, it's very complicated. The final argument is um, that people point to the so-called wood scribes. Uh, there is a Sumerographic combination in Hittite, uh, which um, is translated then as scribes on wood. If you 
take all the references to such wood scribes together, it is very clear that they are uh, administrators, administrators of royal storerooms from that provided the materials for uh, cultic festivals and so on. Um, and I have no doubt that such, uh, that many of such wood scribes were literate and they may on occasion have used uh, wooden tablets, but the explanation for the wood part here as referring to wooden tablets is not the only one possible as I've already uh, described in uh, a few years ago. Anyway, so, uh, so far the script carries and the problem of the missing social economic uh, administration, which remains a, a big problem and I'm aware that I am taking a minority uh, position in here. And, but that then brings us to the next uh, and almost final section on the social linguistic situation in Anatolia. Uh, yes, it is just a, one more question by uh, Madame Le Monnier. Do, do we have any evidence for poetry in these various languages? If, if so, uh, what were the recurring themes? Uh, that's a great question. Um, um, there are a few, but they are really, really very few. There are uh, a few scraps of Hittite yeah, literature, say, uh, that people have interpreted as poetry. And I mean, that's fine with me, but they are really uh, very few. Now, it, um, it also depends on what do you take as poetry? Um, if you define poetry as, or if you can define poetry also as something written in meter, then you may have a wider, um, um, yeah, area of research, um, a wider choice of texts. Um, there's been a long discussion within Hittatology on whether, for example, some of these originally Hurrian mythological tales or epics, whether they were written in meter. Personally, I'm not, um, I'm not convinced um, that meter existed. I think it's very hard to prove, but Again, I, uh, um, there are people who strongly believe in it. Um, so if you, if you were to include those texts, then you come into the realm of epic and, and, and so forth. Um, going back to those few things, really a handful of, of short passages that, has been, that have, uh, have been called poetry, um, then it is, for example, there's one on uh, which doesn't really seem to be Hittite, but maybe a dialect, Nesha Shwaspash, uh, clothes of, of Nesha, Nesha being the same as Kanesh. Um, yeah, they seem, they seem to uh, reflect very local, um, yeah, pieces of, of literature sayings or uh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm not very clear on this I'm, I'm sorry but uh, so there's I think very little uh, evidence for poetry there may be more for meter but personally I'm not a big believer no no further questions for now okay so going back to one of my first slides where I gave the list of uh, Indo-European languages of the Anatolian branch. We had uh, Hittite, uh, Palaic, um, both in cuneiform. We had the two kinds of Luwian in cuneiform and hieroglyphs. Um, the relation, now Palaic is a very small corpus, uh, but Luwian is, is actually quite extensive and uh, much present, one could say. The relation between Hittite and Luwian, you might, I usually tell my students that it's a little bit like Spanish and Italian, but maybe uh, people have better, other people have better um, uh, comparisons. And of course, we have to think of the presence, although we don't know for how long, of the Hattian speakers that 
possibly indigenous uh, population speaking a uh, totally unknown language when the Indo-Europeans moved into uh, Anatolia. Now, we can observe starting in the old Hittite period, so roughly 1650-1400 BC, we can observe an increasing Luwian interference in the Hittite, in the written Hittite language as we have it. For example, we see loanwords, clearly Luwian loanwords in the Hittite texts. We see verbal and nominal derivations uh, with very specific Luwian suffixes entering the Hittite language. Um, we see Luwian inflected word forms in Hittite texts. Um, and usually, at least as of the late 14th century, um, we see that scribes actually mark them by having them preceded by two, one or two uh, gloss, as we call them, gloss wedges. They are known as the glossenkeil wörter. And uh, almost all of these are Luwian words. And the this marking by the Hittite scribes, which is still kind of a, yeah, problem. What was the exact function of it? But it must, it may have functioned at least in part, like we may italicize a foreign expression. If I use uh, a French expression par excellence within an English text, I will it italicize it or a Latin word. I may italicize within an English uh, text, like I italicize here, the German word in uh, an English text. Um, it has also been observed, for example, I mentioned to you earlier that the Hittite language is very fond of, is characterized by these multiple clitic elements at the beginning of a sentence. It has been observed that there are over time certain changes in the order of those elements, and that development has also been linked to Luwian um, influence. And of course, we have seen um, the dichotomy between Hittite and uh, the cuneiform script for, I would say, purely internal purposes uh, within the administration of the ruling elite versus the hieroglyphic script writing Luwian for public display purposes. Um, and this then has led um, to, and I, I agree to uh, scholars, yeah, debating whether maybe in the 13th century at least, or at least in the last 50 years or so of the kingdom, uh, so between 1250 and 1200, there may have been a diglossia situation in the Hittite kingdom of that moment. A diglossia situation where, again, Hittite was the official medium of the Hittite state on all the tablets and so forth, there is an cuneiform, as opposed to the majority of the population speaking Luwian and being addressed in Luwian in those publicly displayed um, inscriptions. Um, even, I mean, and it could be that Hittite was only spoken by a small minority in the capital versus the rest of the population Luwian, but it may even have gone as far as Hittite, although being the official medium of the state, no longer really being anybody's mother tongue. So, a more uh, like modern standard Arabic, for example, versus all the local uh, variants of Arabic. Um, but these are th things that are still uh, debated. And that brings me then to the final uh, section, but maybe there are questions first. Yes, yeah, so there's one question by Anustop Uh Can we infer of an oral tradition supplementing the writing tradition? Um, yeah, I, I said earlier that probably every culture has an oral tradition. Um, and I'm sure the 
Well, I mean, I, I can't, I, obviously I cannot be sure, but I assume that the Hittites had uh, their own oral tradition, which may partly have been written down in these, in the story of Apu and the Queen of Kanesh and, and others. Um, we also know from the Hittite texts themselves that there, there are examples, not very many, but there are examples of texts being read out loud. So there was a culture of, um, of reciting and listening. Um, so yeah, I assume there was an oral tradition uh, of which we may know a little bit through some of the written texts, but maybe most of it has gone lost to us. No, no, no further questions. Okay, so then finally continuation and discontinuation. Um, between 13, uh, 1650 and 1200, roughly dated, uh, chronology is always a difficult uh, topic, um, we have this uh, vibrant Hittite kingdom uh, in, uh, centered in the Hittite capital, Hattusa. According to uh, current archaeological archeo uh, interpretation, uh, the royal elite, a ruling elite, abandoned the capital um, around 1200. And here you see a sort of a, 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 a how we can imagine the Acropolis where the Hittite royal elite lived in Hattusa, uh, the capital. Um, why they abandoned the capital, we don't really know. Traditionally, if you read older books and literature, uh, the sea peoples always come up. But I think nowadays we are moving more into um, maybe a combination of uh, economic and ecological arguments um, for the elite abandoning the capital. And it would help to know if we know where they went, but we don't know. There is a feeling that they may have moved south or southeast because that is where we see some elements of Hittite culture, of late Bronze Age Hittite culture continuing, but we really don't know. 1200, the abandoning of the royal capital Hattusa really seems to mark the end of the Hittite kingdom. And with that, the Hittite language comes to an end, the Hittite cuneiform script comes to an end, um, and the, what happened was that the that same Acropolis and the rest of the city uh, was reduced to over time to rubble. People continued living there, Iron Age populations, uh, repurposing buildings, using uh, Hittite building material for their own buildings. But in the end, uh, but it 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 uh, it never again was the seat of any real government. Um, what we do say, what we do see is that so Hittite stops, Cuneiform stops, but Luwian lives on and the hieroglyphs live on, usually or mostly in this area of southeastern Turkey and northern Syria. There we see from, let's say, uh, 1000 uh, BC, so the, the very, so the early Iron Age, we see. Um, quite a few, a wealth of inscriptions in Luwian, Luwian uh, coming up and uh, expressing uh, what local peoples there wanted to express. So, um, and that I think is a further argument, the fact that Luwian and the hieroglyphs lived on for the vibrancy of the Luwian language and, that, and their hieroglyphic script in central Anatolia, which then uh, survived the fall of the Hittite kingdom and continued at first uh, mostly here. Later on, we see it also moving in here, but we see that uh, central Anatolia, where once the mighty seat of the Hittite kingdom was, uh, becomes a tabula rasa for about the next 400 years. It is not until the eighth century that we see 
the first Phrygian uh, writing coming up in that same area. Luwian then in the hieroglyphic script, they continue until about 700 in this area here until they are completely run over by the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And then that's the end of Luwian and, uh, the, and the hieroglyphic script. But fortunate for us, uh, right around that same moment, 700, 7th century, we see in the West alphabets coming up. The alphabets of Lydia, Caria, and Lycia. As I said, uh, indigenous alphabets, uh, maybe at first looking like Greek, but they aren't. Um, and um, then finally, uh, with Pacific and Sidetic, as I said earlier, we come to, oops, sorry, we come to the, um, we come to the final end of the uh, Anatolian branch of Indo-European languages. Thank you. Thank you very much, Theo. Um... Are there any more questions? Bearing on any part or the whole of this presentation. I don't see any right now. Um, I hope I didn't speak too long. Probably I did. No, that, that, that is absolutely fine. And I, I think we had many questions during the presentation itself. So uh, that's also part of the reason. Uh, might I just ask one question myself? Um, mm -hmm. So, so these hieroglyphs, they're obviously 100% rooted in an indigenous tradition. And you can, uh, you can nicely trace a an indigenous genealogy by which they sort of emerge out of ecliptic tradition and of local imagery and iconography. Uh, my, my question is simply this, uh, has the idea that um, the Egyptian model of digraphia per se, and the, the general model of a digraphia could have been a source of um, perhaps not inspiration, but something to be emulated at some point also for political reasons, has this idea any merit at all? Um, that, yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's difficult to answer. Um, I mean, the, so, so there are two sides to this. On the one hand, um, scholars, of course, have thought about the origins of, the, of this hieroglyphic script. Um, and then there are two possible sides to look at, either Egypt, but the structure of the hieroglyphic script that we are talking about is so, is so very different from the Egyptian system that that doesn't seem to be very likely. Uh, the other direction one could look at is the Aegean uh, scripts like Linear B, for example. And it is striking that the, uh, the if, I may, if I may, yeah, the, the Anatolian hieroglyphic script, as we nowadays call it, uh, the Anatolian hieroglyph hieroglyphic script shares with Linear B the uh, characteristic that we have only signs for vowels and for consonant vowel. So only sa, pa, ga, gi, gu, etc. Um, whereas the cuneiform script, both in Mesopotamia and as used by the Hittites, um, has consonant vowel, vowel consonant, consonant vowel consonant signs. Um, it's um, at least that part is really different. So um, did the inspiration for the writing, for the hieroglyphs as a writing system, did that have something to do with the Aegean? I don't know. Um, as to the, and I think that's more what you are referring to, um, the, the, um, uh, how do you say, the, the incentive to come up with a second script, uh, can that be related to the digraphic situation in Egypt? It's possible. I, we, we already, so we, I personally would see the rise or the development of these 
symbols into a writing system, a hieroglyphic writing system, um, I would think we can date that to the 15th century, uh, depending a little bit on how gradual you see that developing or whether there was once one person sitting down and saying, okay, now I'm going to devise, design a, 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 a script with these symbols. Um, uh, but on the other hand, I mean, we, we all, I showed you that Hattusili ligature. To my mind, that's really old Hittite. So, uh, but I, I know there are different thoughts about that. So I, I'm for a large part more a believer in a gradual development. Um, but anyway, so to what extent were Hittites in the, were there already Hittite relations between the Hittite kingdom and Egypt in the 15th century? I think there were some. Was that enough to, um, to serve as an inspiration for the adoption or the development of a second script um, along hieroglyphic lines? It, it may be. I mean, it, it could take one person and one contact to do so. So, yeah, I think this is, uh, it's a very interesting question. But to my mind, at this moment, it's very difficult to answer it. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, there's one more question by Stephanie Selover. Uh, I don't know if I say it right. Is there much of an idea of how the clitic material would have been as part of spoken Hittite? And a lot of thanks. Um, um, can, can you, can you, sorry, can you read the, the, uh, the, the, the question again? My apologies. Is, is there much of an idea of how the clitic material would have been as part of spoken Hittite? Ah, okay. Um, hi, Stephanie. Um, uh, yeah, I think there can be little doubt that the, I mean, assuming that you are referring to the clitic elements that we, I have this one phrase, um, uh, I think that was very central to the Hittite language and must have formed a part of the, of everyday spoken speech. And I have to add, um, those clitics as being characteristic for the Hittite language are not just characteristic of the Hittite language, but it is characteristic of the, if there's anything that defines, I think, within all Indo-European languages, the Anatolian branch as indeed belong together as a little subfamily, it's that, it's, uh, they are those clitic elements. That is really extremely characteristic. So not just for Hittite, but also for Luvian, uh, all the way into Lydian, Lycian, and who knows, Carian, but we, uh, we don't know. Um, so yeah, I think they were definitely uh, an integral part of spoken Anatolian languages. And so we also have a lot of thanks. So briefly, and Julia Campbell, un grand merci, Professor Vandenhout et Ilara pour ce colloque si intéressant, bravo. Andrea Valletta, thanks for the presentation. Very clear and interesting. Nate, uh, thank you very much. Virginia Herman, thank you, Theo. It's great to hear you again and get your latest views. Uh, El Boan, no questions here, but a thank you from the, for this very interesting talk. Max Gerner, thank you very, very much. Very interesting presentation. Lena Fialkowska, thank you. This was absolutely fascinating. Vera Lemonnier, merci, Professor. Très intéressant. Sharon Mengi, thank you a lot for the great presentation. Paolo Scanapieco, Thank you very much for the very interesting and clear excursus. I think we, we should wrap it up here. Theo, thank you so much again for accepting our invitation. We have enjoyed your talk uh, tremendously. May I, may I just briefly thank everybody for attending and for all the interesting questions and uh, very kind words at the end. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, and me too. Uh, let me thank all those who watched and interacted with the live chat. And so with uh, the, the themes that you have sounded tonight about uh, multiple languages, multiple scripts, uh, contacts, interferences, we are already moving into the direction of what happens next, namely a series of two roundtables on the topic of local multilingualism in rare, rare languages, a type of linguistic ecology that was arguably the most widespread on the planet until only a few centuries ago.
So, uh, Professor Frederike Lübke from the University of Helsinki will be our guest and coordinate a roundtable on local multilingualism in Africa, Amazonia, and the Atlantic space on Thursday, February the 18th, at beginning at 4 p.m. Parisian time. And the week before that, Old Singer from the University of Melbourne will join in sharing a roundtable on local multilingualism in the Pacific area on Thursday, February the 11th, 9 a.m. Parisian time. Uh, the names of the participants will be announced on our website and social networks this Friday. See you Thursday in two weeks' time.